pleased to um, present Arnaud Caron, the uh, head of Portfolio Court. That's a new title. I haven't seen that one. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Um, Getting creative on the names. And um, <laughs> so this is uh, talking about microservices and new architectures. So clearly a very um, innovative topic and something that's going to be have a big impact on um, our industry in the IP domain going forward. So take it away, Arnaud. Thank you so much, uh, Wes. So welcome. My name is uh, Arnaud Caron with uh, MediaKind. I'm driving the cloud transformation of the portfolio. That's what it means, if you didn't guess it. Um, so I guess you're interested into the cloud, you're interested into the uh, microservices, but not at any price. It has to cope with the uh, broadcast quality and the constraint we have in our industry. Very quickly on MediaKind, uh, we are a global media company operating for many years. You might know us from the previous name, which is Ericsson Media Solutions. Uh, we do end-to-end uh, -end, uh, broadcast OTT deliveries um, uh, for our operators. Um, you can find us in the hall number four. Uh, we have fresh coffee, we have free, uh, fresh waffles, and the racetrack as well. Why not? Um, this presentation is built into uh, two parts. Um, the first one is setting the scene on why we are here talking about that topic. Very interesting topic, as you can guess. And then how magically and ultimately we are transforming our cherished video services into small micro components. Let me st start with where we are today. So sit back, relax. Um, I'm starting with this. This is where we're coming from. This is uh, John Baird, the inventor of TV. I'm not going back to the <laughs> 1929, but I think it's interesting to understand the roots of this industry that is really into the electronic science and not really into the computing and in the software area. Um, to set the bit, bit the scene on the challenges for years and years, uh, the industry mostly focused on the performance, trying to increase the quality of services and to squeeze more TV channels into constrained network and limited power. Uh, of course, not compromising on the very high reliability that we expect and the uptime, the 24 slash 7 uptime for the live TV. Um, of course, so far, we did not care much about um, uh, the flexibility of the solutions. We care mostly about the density. Um, but now we can do that. We can run on IT, uh, IT standard equipment, and this is what we want to achieve, uh, what I want to achieve today with you. Guess you know about that. This is one of the big pressure for the, op the operators, cable, satellite, uh, telco operators, uh, that OTT story. I'm really not going into that discussion now. I will not go into uh, details about this, but you can feel that the big difference now is that that guy is coming fast on the market with new content, new ways to address customers, and this is really shaking the industry and we have to adapt it. The quality, the density, the cost effectiveness is important, but we have to manage as well the flexibility of the solutions and the fast time to market. This is the, this is the, the proposal here. Um, among the, the, the multiple key challenges that are really uh, the barriers for this, um, since the conversion of the, uh, from the analog signals to digital bit streams, and the broadcast and media industry has been using uh, industry-specific interfaces. We all know about uh, SDI and different protocols that are assigned to this, or even before that, uh, to move signals between and through facilities. There is now the SDI over IP, as you all know, of course, and I'm not going into SDI over IP today. Um, to stay competitive, the production and constant delivery needs uh, a faster time to market and be more agile in terms of uh, development environment. Uh, so this broadcast industry specific interfaces and infrastructure really impedes the ability to realize this. High level, I give you the answer already. We are moving to media, uh, so we are moving media to IP cloud native. Um, so how do we adapt to this new area? This is really the foundation, the future of this, uh, this industry uh, that will be leading all the core software in, uh, investment of most of the companies around there. Um, there is, of course, the first important barrier, which is the infrastructure. Infrastructure, traditionally, in the media domain, we care about our own uh, various hardware uh, appliance, own broadcast, own um, video physical interfaces, even some own chipsets for doing some processing capabilities very efficiently. Uh, unfortunately, to move to the next level, we need to be able to execute 
on off-the-shelf hardware and run it on standard data center because that's the way to scale, that's the way to go faster, uh, to run on-prem, private or public clouds with unified management and tools. Um, besides, sorry, here, yeah. Besides, we need to be able to deliver new services at the internet speed, whatever it means. It means very fast, surely. Um, there's just the aggressive competition. Um, see up there, uh, you were doing typing configuration changes on the, on the front panel. That, that works, yeah, it works. But it's not super efficient, it's not super scalable, it's not super fast. Um, so if you want to operate the media solutions faster and improve agility, uh, then you need to focus on the applications that you're running, not on the infrastructure itself. You need to abstract applications from the infrastructure, rely on standard infrastructure, um, and deploy your applications uh, as you deploy inf applications uh, in the new way uh, of standard tools we have today in the IT industry. Um, of course, the last, we are trying to make money here. I mean, most of us, I guess. Um, but it's not only that. It's also that we need to adapt to new uh, business and commercial models that are coming here. You were buying equipment for five, ten years in the past that were using sitting in data center never moved. This is not what is expected now. We want to be able to move from one vendor to another. We want to be able to expand. We want to be able to add new features very quickly uh, versus some fixed hardware that we had in the past. So the business models and the commercial models are also evolving uh, for this. Let's recap a bit uh, the cloud overall and cloud native solutions uh, value. Um, of course, I mentioned a lot about leveraging the network and infrastructure. For this, you have the hardware cost reductions. You can buy hardware, high volume of hardware from HP, from Dell, from Cisco, from whoever you want that will be uh, less expensive, that dedicated appliance build up for a specific use case. You can get an infrastructure agnostic. Whatever application you want to deploy, you can deploy it on the same infrastructure. And that's very interesting when you want to scale or change or adapt your services. Then it's about the operations, streamlined services, um, and the cloud operations level, meaning automations, meaning fast tie to market, meaning agility. Again, you want to be able to deploy your new applications quickly, and you want to replicate it because you want to scale at some point. You want to add new channels. And you don't want to do that overnight, and you don't want to do that and come back again and again every, every, even, uh, every six months or three weeks, depending on how frequently you change and adapt. You want to automate this. Um, and if you're able to do that, if you're able to deploy new solutions, new processing functions very quickly and uh, efficiently in a replicable manner, then you can have a better uh, uh, cons customer experience. You can enable new services quickly. You can uh, launch new services. And if you're not happy, easy, you just shut it down. That's very quickly to be done. It it's very more efficient this way than it was uh, in the past. And then you can embrace innovations. You want to launch a new type of channels, a new type of protocols. You want to test something. You can do it very quickly again. Remember, this is the same infrastructure. You just deploy applications on top of the same infrastructure. Ultimately, the, the value of the cloud solutions is twofold. First, related to the potential savings um, that make possible by the technology, and, and second, related to the new revenue streams uh, that you can get by this non-promotional non approach, I would say. So let's get a bit more, more technical. What's so specific for media? Um, it's important to understand that the technology, the cloud-native technology, is not designed for the media. It's designed for web-based uh, solutions. It's designed for e-commerce. It's designed for um, all that type of applications that run today in the public cloud that you can get access on your phone, whatever. But they are nothing really adapted for the media uh, natively. So we have to adapt uh, these solutions and our applications to be able to rely to get these uh, uh, benefits from the uh, cloud native uh, uh, technologies. There is something that is transactional. Transactional is all the things that the, the cloud native solutions are good at. When you have an e-commerce uh, web portal, it's all about transactions. You buy something, you have your, uh, your basket, you do uh, payments and so on. It's all about transactions. So when you do, when you want to watch live TV, access to your list of movies, SVOD uh, type or whatever, of a solutions, it's all about transactions. And that works pretty well into the uh, cloud native ecosystem. 
and technology. Um, when you have, uh, sorry, it's this one, sorry for that. Um, the second uh, type of uh, flow is the flow oriented, the workload flow oriented. So that's about all about sending the video feeds from one the entry point to the to the consumer at the end of the day, and this is definitely not a use case that the cloud native technologies are good at. Um, the reasoning is that uh, we are mainly uh, flow oriented in terms of video for live TV, and that creates a pretty high constraints on the network. You can imagine the bandwidth, the latency, the reliability we expect it. When you have an e-commerce website, there's only what? Some few images that are going from one location to another very quickly. Here we talk about video feeds going uh, all over the, the infrastructure. Um, so very challenging for, for this uh, type of scenarios. Um, the last one here, it's the storage based. So all about the, uh, uh, typically the network PVR solution. So when you press the record button on your screen and do recording in the cloud, for instance, this requires a lot of storage. Uh, this volume of storage is not typical in, uh, in, the, in the IT and web technologies in this industry. And the, the, the components we use uh, from the IT industry are not very great at doing high storage uh, with a quick access and live recording at the same time and so on with very limited buffers. So in order to uh, satisfy our TV consumer, we have to make all that architecture working together with the agility we expect on the new solutions and with a limited cost. Easy. That's where Oops, yes, sorry. That's where uh, our video services uh, become micro. So I'm not going into why we need IP with SDI or IP. I think you got that. Cloud native solutions. I'm going into details about now how we transform our applications into cloud native and into something that can bring the benefits we expect for, for our, our customers today, our operators today. I'll start first with this. Um, I'm not going into details of all the cloud <laughs> names or namings. This is really a buzzword. You can get lost. I even discover some new things uh, some from time to time, some new ideas, new concepts, new technologies, new definitions, new vendor name, new service, new standard, new technology. It's all popping up very quickly. It's mixing everything. I think what is important for me in this, uh, in this layers is that um, how do we do they compare each other? How do we get benefits out of this for the media industry? How do we get something that is relevant for us with our constraints that I mentioned in the previous uh, workflows? And that's probably the most important. The next few slides will be pretty technical, uh, but I'd like to first um, recap a bit on this concept of appliance, virtual machines, and containers orchestrations. Of course, you can guess we're talking about containers at the end of the day. Um, that's the deployment patterns. The first one is the traditional deployment pattern. You see uh, the, the appliance, the hardware, the, the operating system, the applications as a monolithic application running. That's easy to picture. Um, it's, um, it's very simple. Uh, but uh, the, unfortunately, it's simple, but it's not easy to scale because you have to duplicate this. You have to. Uh, connect to the platform, you have to configure it and, and, and to scale it, that's not easy, that cannot be very dense as well, that depends on the case. Um, then you say, okay, I'd like to abstract my infrastructure because if I can deploy infrastructure very quickly and applications on top, then I already have a lot of flexibility and, and agility. That's where typically we think about virtual machines. Virtual machines is easy, everyone can build up a virtual machine on his own laptop, that's, that's no big deal. Um, you clearly decouple the hardware from the software, so you create these abstractions. Uh, what is nice is that this hypervisor, which is the management or the orchestration management of the uh, virtual layer, uh, is completely open API. You can script it, you can replicate it, you can duplicate everything. This is very, very easy to replicate your applications all across your infrastructure. But unfortunately, there is challenges for scale because a virtual machine is very heavy. So heavy constraints, there's a loss of performance. In our case, for instance, in the case of video processing and doing encoding, we definitely care about the 5-10% that we lose in terms of performance, or CPU performance on the, um, on the hypervisor. So that's a big constraint. Uh, and the deployment as well is a bit of an issue because it's very heavy. 
But then it comes this orchestration. We call that based on containers. It's called Kubernetes. It's all the IT technologies that are uh, newly coming up, and I will come back into details here. Basically, you have the same kind of uh, abstraction you have from the virtual machines within the containers. Containers are, are just packaging your applications. So you have the abstraction to the hardware. You can easily uh, deploy it. It's very flexible. You can easily scale it. You don't have the loss of performance um, from the, as, as you have from the hypervisor. Uh, but if you want the virtual machines between your operating system and your container, you can still have virtual machines. For some IT cases, that might be very interesting to have virtual machines. Um, the only or the main, the main drawback, and it's not a small one, is that it's a pretty young technology. Not really young on the market overall, but young for us in the media industry. And remember what I said, media industry is specific in terms of flows, network, storage, and so on. So we have to be careful on the way we use that technology that has been designed for web-based application, e-commerce, uh, how we use it for the media. Let me try to illustrate uh, quickly the operational issues at the, at the scaling. Um, of course, with just a few notes, uh, manual management is feasible. You can use scripts, you can manage it uh, quickly and easily. Uh, when you have uh, 10 plus nodes or something, this is really becomes a significant task. Uh, you need a team, you need some people to manage that. You increase your operational cost. Well, suddenly you said, I can use some data center or IT infrastructure, so I reduce my capex, but I need more people to manage <laughs> my reduced capex. That that's doesn't fly, that doesn't work. How do I do that? Then you increase again, you need a team, you need a bigger team, it's getting more and more issues. And obviously at the end of the day, it burns. Yeah, there's always something in happening. The COTS hardware are probably less reliable than the dedicated hardware we had in the past from the broadcast industry. Yes, because they are designed to be replaceable objects anyway. It's, it's part of their DNA at some point. Yeah, you can change the hard drive, you can change the network. It's designed to fail at some point. Um, so unfortunately, if you manage a large scale, then you keep, keep managing that all the time. Uh, it's very, very uh, heavy in terms of operations. But then, of course, when you change a hard drive, for instance, you have to redeploy your application. So you have to connect to the, to the, to the blade systems, to the server, so reconnect here remotely, redeploy your applications, add it in the clusters, and so on. It's getting very, very complex. Um, that's where that guy, the guy from Kubernetes, that's an open source, uh, software, I'm coming into details in a minute on this, came come into the pictures and the way to orchestrate your applications. If you don't know this uh, this comic, this is coming from Google Cloud. It's a very interesting comic that explains uh, all the concepts, why Kubernetes is interesting, why as an operator of a data center I have so many issues and how that could be solved by Kubernetes. It's not specific to media, it's a generic one, but uh, uh, worth, worth a read. Let me go into some bit more deep details about uh, microservices. So that's um, simply a way to build software applications. We are in the land of the software architecture, uh, building a software applications into smaller components that could be deployed uh, individually. Basically, we compare the monolithic applications that you see, oh, let me do that here, yes, that you see here, monolithic applications, big applications, all your functions are inside it. Uh, versus the microservices applications where you basically split the same functions. It's the same, doing the same things. It just splits different ways and there are ways to talk together. That's what is microservices. Seems not very fancy, but think about this. Uh, what if I have an alarm module or log module in my monolithic applications running 24 uh, slash 7 live services and this module fails? What's happened? What's happening? Well, my full application fails. My service is down. I have a service interruption because the log manager of my application fails. That's an interesting concept that probably you're not happy with. If you go microservices, this alarm management can fail. Okay, that's fine, it fails. Or the log management fails, okay. But your encoding capabilities is still running. You don't have service interruptions. That's, that's the beauty of this. You can um, have a better re resilience, reliability with that, uh, that type of solutions and a better scalability as well. Why do I need to scale my log management when I want to scale my encoding functions? 
just doesn't make sense. Why would I waste some CPU? Why would I waste some running software for this? It just, just doesn't make sense. So the beauty of microservice is around this. Um, it's around uh, better scalability, better reliability. As a software company now, it's also very interesting for us in terms of development because we can reuse the components. All the portfolio we use today, we have today, is based on the same alarm management and the same log management. We don't duplicate it, we don't do it again. And we don't duplicate the bugs as well, that's a <laughs> different story. So you see, there's a, uh, there's, although there is a limit here, there is, um, in the past, you were managing one big application, so you can picture, this is pretty easy, I deploy it, I run it, it works, and I have everything in a box. And now I said, okay, now I need to deploy 20 different small components. That was me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so it seems very painful in terms of operations to manage these 20 different components and to deploy them and to manage. So we need to be able to package that application. This is where the concept of containers are coming into the picture. Containers uh, that enable the packaging of these individual microservices that enable them to isolate from the host as well. And the beauty here is that they are very much transportable lightweight compared to the VM. Again, remember, I split the, uh, my big applications into smaller things, and I'm not embedding anymore the operating system as I do in the VM, so that's, that's very small, very easy, very lightweight. Um, we embed the runtime code as well as the configuration, as well as the dependency into one box called a containers. Typically, we talk about Docker containers. There are other technologies, but Docker is the mainstream one. You might see the blue whale well, that's, that's the one. It's not really a new technology. This is coming from the roots uh, in the early days of Linux kernel uh, with the isolation, isolation sorry, of the process capabilities. It's just we are relying on some core technologies from Linux to isolate the processing functions, your, your processing sorry, um, uh, features inside, inside containers. To some extent, it's comparable to VM uh, but as it's abstracting the infrastructure except it's more lightweight and simply has no overhead. Sorry. Sorry. So now I have my small microservices components. I put that into containers, so I picture that I can put that anywhere in the infrastructure. That's very nice, but still, how do I deploy them? How do I manage it? That's where we have this orchestration and Kubernetes. Remember the sailor or man uh, just a few slides uh, before. Kubernetes, what, it is, what is it? Sorry. Uh, this is the workflow orchestration engine uh, that can enable my application in the form of containers to be dynamically managed into infrastructure resources, deploy, scale, failover of the containers. Uh, it's actually a technology that's been initiated, invented by uh, Google, uh, Google Cloud, and delivered to the open source community five years ago. So it's a pretty new technology in the form of Kubernetes. Five years is not that far. Uh, but it's pretty old technology in the form of Google that claims to have it for 15 years or something. Um, it's very widely used in the IT industry and uh, even beyond that, all the e-commerce, most of the applications that you're running on your phone that is connected to some backend in the cloud is most probably running uh, a Kubernetes engine in the background with containers. Um, remember, we said, that's nice, but how do I make it for uh, my media applications? I have to be careful on this. Just to go a bit deeper on Kubernetes, because it's, it's still abstracted, I guess, and um, there's a lot of literature about that. I built up uh, one slide. What is interesting with Kubernetes for the agility and the deployment is that it's, we call that everything as a code. You configure some file, and from these files, you can orchestrate and manage all your applications, all your data center this way. Let me show you. Um, your applications, in the forms of microservices, whatever color we put that, with some database or not database, some security, things like this, um, are distributed across the nodes. Kubernetes is distributing the applications across the nodes by itself. It can even replicate two times the same applications or the same pods of applications if you need a high availability. Or it can just fail over one of these pod set of containers automatically if it comes to fail. He can pull the status of these containers. If they are failing, he creates a new one. 
You will not create it on the same node. You can create it on another node, but ultimately, you don't care. It's not very important where your applications are created or where your containers are running. The most important is that they're running in the same cluster. They can talk to each other, and they can scale and fail over easily with the orchestration layer. You see, we are really abstracting the infrastructure from the application layer. We are delegating to Kubernetes, or to the orchestration and the containers, the management of the life cycle of our small components on the infrastructure. Remember how you do today, you SSH uh, an operating system, a Linux, you deploy your application, you know exactly where it is, you know exactly which video services or which applications is running on with each node. In this case, you leave it to Kubernetes to do that for you. Be why? Because you don't care. Ultimately, what you want is the service to be running and the infrastructure to be working. If the infrastructure fails, Kubernetes will take care of your applications and will babysit it and put it somewhere else. And then you can replace your infrastructure. In the past, one node was failing. You have to already think about, oh, I have my full video services on this phone. I have to move it somewhere else. There's a high panic thing and so on. It does not happen anymore with this type of, uh, of technology. Um, so to get into details about a bit of the here, of the infrastructure as a code, this file is a YAML file. So that's pretty standard in the IT, IT technology and you can instruct, instruct uh, Kubernetes on how to deploy the applications that are actually uh, split into multiple parts on your infrastructure. You can define the resources that you need. These applications need 25 vCPU on my infrastructure. And Kubernetes will audit the, the infrastructure and we say, oh, I have 25 vCPU available here. I will put it there. So that's a way for you to not overload the capacity of your infrastructure. Um, these are just a few examples of the rules. There's many, many, many rules. Uh, pretty important, container shipping, that one container ships. I'm not going into much details here. Remember, all the story about containers is to build small components, small microservices that you can scale and you have the flexibility. But if you build a, a very big container because you are lazy to uh, get your monolithic applications into smaller components, then everything, uh, all the benefits you expect are lost. You cannot easily fail over a very big ship because you need 120 vCPU for this. You cannot easily uh, manage it. So be careful of this. Reaching, I'm very late, sorry, <laughs> reaching the end. Um, typical cloud native architecture that we have in our solutions. And I will go in this one. Okay. It's okay. It's okay? Okay, sorry. Okay, it's, um, so the architecture you've seen just before, okay, let me show you quickly because it's just a way to package your media applications. Media microservices, we talked about that in the form of containers, or pod of containers orchestrated by Kubernetes is very nice. Everything is automated, but it's not enough. You need to have an application management on top, so dedicated to media. We need to know what's happening when um, specific media microservices fail or not. We need to be able to manage that and to give the information to the operator. It's not a black box. It's something very open for this. There is more analytics. There is more layer happening, so it's higher complexity. have to be careful about the higher complexity versus the standalone client box. The beauty as well is that it's operatable into multiple data centers, bare metal, OpenStack, which is a private cloud, a VMware, Google Cloud, Azure, my AWS, works exactly the same way in all that environment. That's how we can deploy on-prem data center offers and deploy exactly the same offers as a SaaS offering into the public cloud today, exactly the same software running exactly the same way. Of course, there are constraints about your IP, how you're feeding Google Cloud or AWS with this, uh, IP, but that works exactly the same way whenever you fix this, uh, this uh, issue. A quick example of uh, how we do that on Kubernetes. This example illustrates all the microservices in the different boxes, in the different colors that are deployed by Kubernetes. Um, unfortunately, Kubernetes is not able to manage seamless failover of an encoding function, of a stateless function, because it's not designed for this. Uh, that's why we need to add on top of this our workflow from the media where we said we need one plus one synchronization between the encoder in case of failure of one of the encoder we still have the other one or we have some loss of video and the last one um, this is uh, the journey the journey is pretty difficult i guess but we are getting there 
Um, there's multiple ways to enable cloud. We understood that. It's all about software technologies, but ultimately it's all about the benefits you get as an operations. Um, be sure to select the right partner about that. Remember the big ship container thing. If you have this partner, then you will not get the benefits uh, of the transformations. And transformation journey is also a change into the organizations, into the way we behave and we operate the platforms usually versus in the past. And that's a big change for all organizations. Voilà. Okay, Arnaud, thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much.